If you're watching this in real time, it's almost semester break. If you're watching this in blitz mode, you should probably take a break. You know, it's been six weeks of content. Yeah, get up, stretch, do something else for a bit. All right, so where we are in semester, we are on the last of the marketing mix elements, and this is going to draw together content we've covered in the previous mixes, but also draw down on some of the theory from right at the top end of semester. From here, we move into applications, where you will see the mix get a run in terms of direct case studies. And in the content in this video, we will have case illustrations. We will have sites that we will point to as good examples, as sort of exemplars for you to explore. And that's basically a co-creation self-service module kicking into gear of here's our theory, here's a place where we think it's well executed, go off and explore it to see the theory in practice. So let's kick it in the gear and make it happen. The other thing that we should uh, bring into consideration here is that we're going to talk about some marketing communication theory and some marketing ideas. It's not the complete coverage that you would get in an advertising course or a brand strategy course. It's a highlights reel that works for the key pieces that I want people to try out this semester. There is always more marketing theory and there's always a lot more communications theory at your disposal than just the highlight reel here. So keep that in mind as we go through. If I don't cover one of your theories you've seen before in intro or in advertising or in consumer behavior even, that doesn't mean the theory doesn't apply. It just means it wasn't in my personal evoked set of choices when I was putting the slide deck together. So first thing we need to talk about, social media is governed by more rules and regulations than traditional media and non-social media. You can engage in a wide range of interesting practices outside of the internet. The Trade Practices Act does apply. There are laws and rules that govern misleading advertising. But in particular, there are a couple of specific things you need to be very aware of when you are dealing with the internet. And the first is that the ACCC does take a very active and interested role in pursuing social media and definitely advertising and paid sponsorships need to be declared. Whether it's hashtag paid or hashtag sponsored, you need to make it clear if you are receiving money for content. Which is why, despite the fact you'll see these show up, I get no sponsorship and I have no paid relationship, so I don't have to have hashtag sponsored in play here. Second thing, I'm going to recommend another Tom Scott video to you. This is particularly good and it's going to take some time out so I want to run the advertising reasonably quick for my video so you can spend some of this week's time really appreciating how A, Tom Scott breaks down all the rules and regulations that are for the British market but also explore some of the ethics and moral um, considerations around taking sponsorships and who you want as the endorser of your channel and your channel's content through advertising. So, we always put, I always put IMC at the very end of the process. I always put advertising right at the back end for two reasons. And the first reason is it is the least useful aspect of the marketing mix in its own right. And second is it is the most codependent on the other three aspects of the mix before you can get a good message out. You need to have worked through, you need a target audience. So that means working segmentation, targeting, positioning. You need there to be an offer to make a community to offer. Right, there's got to be value, value proposition, it's got to be a product so that your offering that you are communicating through advertising exists, has a point, has a purpose. Communication for the sake of communication is pointless and a waste of everyone's time and money. You want to communicate with purpose. And 
the purpose of marketing communication is to promote the consumer's understanding of your value offer. You also want to know a lot more about your consumer so you know where to find them. Segmentation begets targeting. Targeting allows for positioning. Positioning also lights up distribution channels. Distribution channels are promotional channels in their own right. <coughs> so there's a bunch of different ways in which you need to have made a series of decisions. Your decisions needed to have a series of consequences. So now you've reached the point where you are interested in providing information to your consumer base about the value offer, how to access it, and why it's a solution to their problem. So the key questions that you want to have established, you need audience because a part of a segmentation strategy is the audience will react differently between target segments to marketing stimulus. Ideally, what you want to be in a position to do is to have a different value communication to each of your audiences so that your audiences will react positively but off different cues, triggers and wants recognition. Atop that, there are a couple of basics that we want to just revisit and briefly revise. There are reasons to engage with advertising and there are reasons to engage in promotion and communication and I'm going to use those phrases relatively interchangeably in this session. Promotion, communication and advertising. There are certain points where you want to use some very specific words and we'll get to those. But here, the purpose of a message is to inform because the person who is receiving the message is in a state of unawareness. So your intention there is to create awareness. At persuasion, you are looking for interest through to desire. At reminder, you are looking to reinforce desire and reinforce action. And at defend, you are looking to maintain action and reinforce desire. The IADA model, awareness, interest, desire, action, is then the tactic that you use. Which part of the funnel are your customers at? What is the message they need to hear to push them to the next part? Also, you have a couple of elements here where if you're in the early stage of a product life cycle, you need to inform customers of your existence. You need to inform them of the value proposition, the value offer. So your PLC, which is a theory right back from your strategy, your tactic and your advertising, communication, promotion objectives are interlinked. And this is why we talk about decisions having consequences and why it was so important to decide what your strategy was where are you on the Ansoft playbook? Where are you in the GE Finance Matrix playbook? And what is the consequence from that? If you're going to a market that already knows you, a market that you have already served, you are wasting time, effort and energy if you're doing awareness campaigns with a group who already know about you. So let's talk through a few different promotion ideas. And again, this is a highlights reel. Uh, a set of suggestions for have a look, deep dive if you think it's interesting or give it another review if you think you can make use of it. So the communication strategy, again this is just a refresher. We have been hammering you on this particular protocol throughout the semester because it is again a marketer's mindset and a marketer's tool set is to say, audience, why am I addressing that audience? So here, slightly different from the overall strategy, we already, at the point of engaging communication strategy, we've already selected a target market. So that's a decision that's already had a consequence. This is our active market. Now that we are engaged with that market, 
and we know a bit about them. We know where they are in the product life cycle. We know what our overall strategy is. How do we want to communicate? What are we willing to invest in that communication? Remembering that our budget includes non-financial budget, time, effort, energy, and financial budget, buying, paying money to buy things. Within that audience, where will our message sit in comparison and contrast to other ideas? So that's our positioning coming back in. And then we've got to create the message and actually go out and implement. So establish message, message strategies. Day in, day out, if you're running an Instagram account, you are doing this. You are writing captions for your content. If you're running Twitter, you're writing tweets. So your communication strategy is very close to your product strategy. And a lot of the social media were very closely connected between the distribution of an idea, the creation of the value offer in the first place, and our overarching communication strategy. This is why when we teach it to you as isolated units, what we are doing is we are showing you the separation to the best of our ability, but realistically we're expecting you to treat it like a Lego set and build it as you need it to make it work. So also, I've been bringing the product lifecycle into communication, and I want to mention this a couple more times because the PLC is a way to filter ideas. It's a good decision-making framework because it's a rough and ready guide to where is my product at? Where's my value offer at? Have I, am I new to the market? If I am, well then, that gives a certain set of ideas that I can start with. And ultimately, all the, the idea of a model or a table like this is that it is a set of prompts and cues to spark your own thinking of how can I use this idea? So marketer co-creation of value with theory, models, and practice comes from what can I use this idea for in my project? So for those of you who have been using a platform, a technology that already you had some track record with, you might be in growth and maturity. For those of you who have just started accounts a matter of weeks ago, you are finding yourself very much in the informational, in the introductory phase, trying to get market share, trying to gain new followers. And maybe some of you are in the wind it up, wrap it up phase of your social media and you're just looking to bring it into a nice soft conclusion. Sell out the merchandise, license out your last couple of things and thank you subscribers for being part of it. If that's the case, you're in mature and decline, and all the way through, those PLC broad areas, those broad ways of thinking, help you decide what's your optimum, what's your next step, what's your next objective, and how do those objectives roll over into tactics. Now, we've mentioned positioning a lot throughout the semester to date, and one of the things about this is there's a lot of different protocols, a lot of different ways you can do positioning. So the chart in front of you is here for you to explore. What we want you to do in something, when we present a model like this, is take your project, your active life project that you're working on from the ETA, and then start emphasizing, well, what do I have that I can use for positioning? Now, for this subject, for e-marketing, I have intentionally gone for image differentiation, the brands, the logo, the color scheme, the whole cyberpunk-esque uh, elements to it. I have gone for product differentiation through the Shadow Hawker self-guided learning system. I'm assuming I'm getting away with a bit of personal, personnel differentiation on the fact that I'm me. And, well, to quote Rocket, ain't no one but me but me. Ain't no one like me but me. 
Finally, the other place where I'm trying to pull off a positioning strategy here is I'm trying to pull together a little bit of service differentiation. And part of that's through customer training. I have set out to run exercises, events, and integration of theory into practice so that you can get value from the use of the assigned readings and the end of uh, PowerPoint presentation readings, but also so you upskill, so that this subject has a purpose, it has a value proposition beyond learn about the internet, it has train in a particular technique, a customer training as a point of differentiation. Now, the other point of uh, positioning, this is one of my favorite sort of crossover points. This is where you take price, financial or non-financial, and you bring it into your communication positioning strategy, and you do this as a, initially, a system check. This is a protocol check. You calculate what your value offer is. When you think about what does the value offer of your product. Then you start thinking about, well, how does it tie into how much time, effort, and energy, and the financial, non-financial investment? Do the two match? So I run an e-marketing subject, and I've put a lot of things in that I'm trying to push it down towards convenience. My aim is to sit somewhere between convenience and prestige. I freely want to target about there because I've put in a number of interventions designed to accelerate consumption, to reduce time cost. But I also know that my ongoing, routine, recurring project plus the weekly drip feed of live action slash shadow hawker events means that I have a higher expectation of time expenditure than I would if everything was available just in the one block alongside all these pre-recorded videos. What you want to do with a model like this is you want to look at your value offer that you are putting out through your project. And you want to start by thinking, where does the value offer sit on this chart? Then map in, where does the distribution fit? Map in again, where does the price, the financial price, and then the non-financial price, look at whether you are roughly in the same quadrants, and then use that to determine what your messaging strategy should be. All four squares are legitimate strategies and good strategies. And this is why decisions have consequences, is that you can't run all four. You can only do one to do it well. And I am high convenient. I am intentionally trying to create a high convenience. Something that sits in here in terms of, I'm, a, I'm part of your weekly agenda, I fit into your weekly agenda, I'm a little time expensive, but there's a bunch of things that get done quick. So that positioning then guides your messaging and your messaging strategy. It comes from customer perception, but also comes from you thinking, what is the product doing? What's the channel distribution doing? What's the price informing? Right, now. How do I reinforce that through my messaging? Another theory I want to mention here is activation theory. I am asking you to be focused in a lot of your activities around a single task, a single task done well, because you are in a training simulation exercise. Your assignments are 2,000 words, 1,500 words, they are short simulation activities designed for training purposes. 
which means that you don't have a lot of room to do everything in the assignments. But I am encouraging you to use the protocols of and to act as a marketer and to treat your self-service internship like a live ongoing concern. To that end, I want to talk about activation theory here in that it's rare to use a single channel for communication. Most of the time, you will want to reach your audience through multiple different channels. And my case example here is the uh, goalie <sighs> gummy jellies. And they, as a consequence of doing this uh, case, by the way, my Instagram feed has been really different lately. There are a number of elements at play here. First of all is this was an interest-driven search. So I've done a keyword search on a brand name. Now that could have been brought about because I've seen it on Facebook and all the other elements all interact. But here, as a search, the first point in time where there is a non-paid placement involved on the front page of Google is near to the bottom of the screen. In fact, that is the same site as the keyword. So this company has bought their own brand name keyword. So when you search for them by name, their brand name keyword site, which is the same as their organic search site, come up side by side. However, Amazon also owns a slice of the keyword action here. So it's go direct or go through an intermediary. See so distribution channels starting to kick in. You also see that there are multiple different channels, distribution channels in play here, which is slightly modifying the different pricing options. The next thing that you have in terms of the advertising here is this is a paid advert uh, that came up on, once I started searching for this brand name, of course, my Facebook started filling with these ads. So I started using that leverage to get my content. This is a sponsored Facebook advert. And you'll notice that it's got a lot of things. It's got a call to arms. It's got a, um, a risk reduction strategy in terms of financial risk through the afterpay. It's got a sense of urgency because it's today only. It's really not. Limited time bundle, today only, free shipping. Look at all these price modifiers, price perception, risk perception modifiers that are in this content. But say that's not enough. Uh, you've, you've seen the Facebook ad, so let's actually change the order. You've seen the Facebook ad, then you've done the Google search. A few days later, you're sitting on Instagram, and what here comes up? You get an advert. Now, there's three things in play here. The first is the paid partnership is recognized. You see that there is a recognition. Remember what the rules are around Instagram and social media? There's a recognition, it's paid, paid sponsorship. It's hashtag ad, so it does have a recognition that there has been a commercial sponsorship arrangement. There is a interesting little hook here. That sponsorship code, that discount code, it is a metric tracking system. When someone activates, purchases, and uses this influencer's code, the company can see how effective their sponsorship arrangement with the influencer is. By using code DD2021, you are crediting your purchase decision to the influencer's influence. You are acknowledging your source. But you're also creating an environment in which the company can go, okay, let's review how much traffic we got versus how much money we spent. So there is a return on investment metric for the organization because they can attribute straight up this person, this code, this outcome. So effectively, activation theory is the idea that you don't just go for a single message channel, you go for multiple shots. You go for multiple places and ways of communicating. You have a call to action. So 
your super aggressive Facebook call to action, fear of missing out activator, your social endorsement. And remember your innovation adoption theory here. The early majority looks to the early adopter for their decisions. They look for that social comparison information. They look to see someone saying it's okay to use this product. So channel, multiple channel, multiple message channel. For you, I have asked you to focus on a single project. At this point in time, I'm going to tell you now to activate that project you're currently working on. It is fair game to light up everything you got in terms of the upcoming advertising, communication, promotion and messaging channels. So let's meet the promotional mix. This is the full list and we're going to, again, go through, pick up a bunch of, well, basically per item, I'm going to explain roughly how it could work and show you a site that's doing it kind of well as your exemplar for you to self-explore. And what you're looking for here is you're looking for two things. Because you're running a live project, you're looking for an opportunity to go, well, could I use one of these protocols? Could I make one of these protocols happen for me? So can it be a, as part of your self-service internship, can it be an application of theory into practice? And the second thing you're looking for here is that gain of knowledge of being able to recognize a protocol when it's in play in real in real time in the world around you. So let's get started. First up, the most blatant, obvious and understandable is advertising. Yours are my favorite barrier to your content. Advertising is basically it should be better than it is. It's got so much more potential than it has uh, realized, but Bluntly, we all know what it looks like. YouTube's a shocker for it. Um, there is a YouTube screen cap earlier in this video series where my ad blocker is on. And I will tell you now, as a professional marketer, I use an ad blocking software because there are so many goddamn amateurs out there, engineers and coders who think they're advertisers and what they're doing is rubbish. So if you've not got an ad blocker, on, I endorse getting that, getting on that. Makes your content so much more accessible. The second place, personal selling. Now, personal selling and the internet's a, an interesting thing at the moment in that I'm going to lump the uh, influencer in here, touch and go. Uh, but basically, imagine if someone cracked open a Zoom meeting and pitched a product to you. That's what you zoom. That's what it would look like. But at the same time, you can do personal selling as an influencer. And one of my favorite uh, blogs of the moment, the uh, Utah and the Mormon Church are producing a lot of content these days, a lot of interesting content. But basically, what you have happened in this particular episode is the two main stars of the channel go out and openly spruik an offer, but they do it in a sort of parasocial connection. They do it, it's worth watching, it's worth watching with your wallet taped down so you don't fall for it, but they very much lay it on. They do a little insert thing, they do a little vignette thing, they do it as quasi-content. Now you can see the advert logo on the screen, you can see it's sponsored, but they very much draw the parasocial, which is why I'm putting it into the personal selling. Next up, uh, everyone's favorite technique, the sales promotion. If you are, for the purposes of this course, running a commercial store, now whether that's an eBay site, a Depop, a Redbubble, please understand that you are never obligated to put your product on sale. In fact, your sales promotion technique should be tied to your positioning strategy because luxury doesn't get discounted. 
luxury only gets more expensive. So if you were running, say, you're doing an art store uh, and you're creating limited edition artwork, the sales promotion is to increase the price to increase the value. If you're working, say, the fast-moving consumer goods, like the Vitable store is here, uh, discounts. But again, you'll note there's a metrices element here. Keyword, Habitat 20. Whoops, Habit 20. That lets them know as well, if you're not using the direct click-through link, you're not using the direct URL approach for your metric, it's letting them see, okay, they picked up that offer. If you have a Shopify account uh, and you're running a Shopify on your WordPress site, there's a lot of different, there's a really good uh, back-end implementation of the various discount codes. So it's relatively straightforward to run the sales promotion. The key to it is that it needs to drive increased purchases without decreasing the overall reference price. If you discount too heavily, too frequently, the consumer that you're targeting will lower what they think a good price for your product is, so that will harm your overall ability to well, be sustainable financially, but also it will change the price in terms of positioning. It will change the expectation of what the product is worth. And taking that out to the uh, brick-and-mortar retailing, I have now made it a personal decision that I won't buy from EB Games when there's a sale on, and I swear I have saved multiple thousands of dollars over that time. But EB Games is almost perpetually running a sale, like this ancient Australian proverb, oh, it's the sale of EB Games. Consequence of which is how long do you need to wait before the, the object you wanted to pay full price for will be at discount? So what point is full price still a real thing? Really be careful on that one. It's very easy to fall into a trap there. Uh, public relations. We're going to bundle this with publicity because if you do your public relations well, it's publicity. No one's going to be able to tell the difference. At the moment, the leading source of PR in Australia is... Uh, political parties. Uh, they're the most blatantly obvious when media is carrying their keyword phrases and their th carefully researched th three-word slogans and their messaging strategies, whether it be social media, old-school media, or uh, influencer bloggers who happen to coincidentally all say the same thing roughly about the same time of the week. Functionally, though, the, the idea of good PR, good public relations, is that you have something of interest by your existence, by your operation, and you have an awareness of idea retailers, people who you could give your content to, who have an audience who would also be interested in this content. So this is why PR and publicity come together quite well. And basically, it comes down to if you've prompt someone to talk about your company, that's PR. And if they're talking about your company unprompted, that's publicity. By the way, the, uh, the link here is a, an Australian uh, Lego builder who has a very interesting and familiar uh, speech pattern, speech intonation pattern. If you do recognize it, please post up in the comments um, or over in the Waddle forum. I've got an idea who I think it is, but I don't want to prejudge you. So have a watch, have a listen. Also, as the Mad Keen um, Lego Series Play person, uh, I just like being able to bring sections of my life together. So the GoPro and the Lego and e-marketing, all in the one box. Also, technically, every single site mentioned in this course is publicity because there's been no, per I have not been contacted by an organization to say, hey, Stephen, could you spruik our stuff in your subject? We have no sponsorship. We have no paid product placement. We have no unpaid product placement. It's all publicity in here. All right, direct marketing. We're very familiar with this. Uh, everyone 
gets emails. <sighs> don't use direct messaging for it. Just don't. Don't bother. Don't go onto LinkedIn to flog a product. All right. Flog yourself on LinkedIn. I'll be a flog on LinkedIn. I don't mind which. But direct messaging's purpose is human to human communication. If someone reaches out to you as when you are running a company, by all means, that is them opening the conversation. But it's really super unsettling to find a, tooth, a toothbrush brand messaging you on Facebook with like a, hey, what up? No, don't, don't, don't be creepy. Don't hurt your brand by being creepy. All right. Also, guys, gentlemen, male members of the audience, direct messages don't be creepy okay just don't and certainly do not use LinkedIn to be a creepy person because LinkedIn is your CV site it's a workplace site and geez HR policies cover it so just don't all right understand that that is a you know, here's your free tip word to the wise don't do it and if you're about the hashtag not all men the reason why it should be not the reason I'm saying this is so you can be part of the not all category rather than the all category. Just don't be creepy in direct messaging. That's the direct marketing is not a place where you want to be creepy. Direct marketing is a place where it's fundamentally linked to the concept of relationship marketing and relationship marketing is built first on trust. If you cannot be trusted in a message and a messaging platform, you cannot build reciprocity and you cannot gain commitment. So, trust first, and as marketers, don't be freaking creepy. Speaking of the occasional bounce into freaking creepiness, uh, the corporate image campaign spun off and separated from PR because the purpose of this campaign is not to communicate a value offer. This is the only time I'm going to ever say this, but there is no value offer being communicated. There is only brand positioning being communicated here. So you can do marketing without a value offer. A corporate image campaign is about trying to bolster, reinforce, or alter the public's positioning of your corporation against other corporate entities. It's also been the home to some of the worst videos in the history of history. And there's one other thing. Under the principles of integrated marketing communication, and I am pained because it pains me to say this, a corporate image campaign needs to be authentic to the organization that's producing it because actions speak louder than paid product placements. SIVA model system check. Information, what does the company know about you? What does the company learn about you? What do they learn about the value offer and what do they learn about your other activities? If you want to go out, uh, now we saw in June a lot of pride washing. Uh, we'll see it any named week, like is it Pride Month or NADOC Week, a bunch of corporations will go out and run corporate image campaigns that they think will make up for their actions for the rip. For the rest of the year, the corporations will throw the uh, LGBT. IQ community under the nearest passing bus for a dollar, but come June it's rainbow flags and hi, give us our give us money please. Insert Mr. Krabs, I like money give here. Functionally again, authenticity beats corporate image campaigns, and there's nothing more authentic than the way your organisation conducts itself. So. If you're an organization that does evil, engages in evil practice, and engages in theft, rampant destruction, destruction of sacred sites, exploitation, or any other behavior, that's your authentic self, so you may as well bloody lean into it and be authentic about it, because your corporate image campaigns won't do jack. 
what they will do is they'll create increased cognitive dissonance and greater hatred of your brand. You may as well lean in or not be evil. All right, and more pleasing area, sponsorship. Okay, this is the area I think is greatly underutilized and where there's a huge amount of opportunity. Sponsorship and product placement are the future for social media and the future for being able to make content where the material that you make is inherently useful within the product framework. Now, we're just going to briefly mention uh, Dom Tomato, Australian free runner parkour and uh, legendary man of solid concrete. This is, this is a person who builds Australia's reputation for being tough as all get up by ridiculous parkour leaps, jumps, and when he collides with walls, the walls say, ouch. But he's sponsored by Red Bull. And it becomes a bit of a game for me to play spot the product placement in his videos. Uh, it's not subtle on the screen cap, and I went looking for not subtle, but there are su subtle things in there. I'm a little uncertain as to how he's going with the advertising um, rules on it, but I don't mind because he's also good value in entertainment, so check it out. But with sponsorship, there's two things I want to briefly mention. Because it's supporting uh, the ACT event or organization, you've got a real chance to find either the image so you are tying together, you're going to sponsor someone because their type of behavior or activity matches the sort of image you want to portray. So you Red Bull, you sponsor athletes because Red Bull is all about activity and lifestyle. But you also have the ability to sponsor where there's a good fit between the product you offer and the activity that you're sponsoring. For example, Adidas sponsoring athletes with ath providing Adidas athletic wear, Adidas shoes, socks, and everything else makes sense for athletes. Adidas sponsoring me to sit here at my computer and record videos makes no sense. So there's not a good fit and it wouldn't be a good engagement. Meanwhile, Pepsi, if you're out there, buddies, yeah, hook a brother up. Also, there are sponsorships in terms of where you can put your product out into the marketplace. There are amazing ranges of opportunities. Also, a sponsorship package is a really useful way to gather market data. People who have already assessed their event and said, we're going to offer sponsorship opportunities have run a whole lot of market analysis on who their audience will be. So you can learn quite a lot about that audience in terms of, well, we have a kidney sponsorship, kidney conference sponsorship. This sponsorship package will show you the different things that are at this conference. And this conference is being run for pure virtual this year. So there's a whole series of online opportunities. Again, it's an untapped opportunity. There's a massive market out here for it, and it's an area that I really encourage you to explore for your own self of what could I, who could I approach as an organization that would make a good fit with what I offer, and what could I then unlock in terms of access to resources or access to materials or access to partnerships to create branded content that's of value to me and to my audience. I want to briefly mention guerrilla marketing tactics insofar as they exist, but the most important thing is don't pretend to be a viral marketing sensation that's organic if your agency created. If you paid content you will get more respect by being paid content than by pretending you are some form of underground, oh no, the citizens of Citizensville created this content. Own it. Own it, be authentic, because 
Every guerrilla marketing campaign that ever exists will feature in a trade magazine at some point because someone who created it commercially needs to get their next job and they need to show the bragging rights that they were the people who did the last job. So you'll get out of it eventually. Uh, product placement. All right, here's a big one, a uh, super useful one. I think that this is also an area where social media influence and just general online existence has a potential to go better. And this is a really untapped area. Two places I think as well it's coming completely untapped is product placement in text. Now we're going to talk a little bit about this when we get to the image and text area, but whilst I keep waving the Pepsi Max can around the place as a product placement, we could as easily use other elements, like the uh, the chair behind me could be a product placement. The I could embed things on screen. Each of these, now again, I haven't received any. In one sense, as a marketer, I am very, very bad at this because I have 15 to or so videos which need case illustrations and I have not once sold the product placement. Because as an educator, I prioritize the creative control and the content control that comes with being able to say what I damn well feel like because I'm the one who inserted the content. The one time I have used a quasi-product placement inside a textbook was to show a photo of a Coca-Cola vending machine. Coca-Cola at the time in uh, early 2000s with the pay wave tap and go and an SMS for a Coke. You could buy from a Coke machine via SMS. And I thought that was an interesting case study to put in an e-marketing text, so I wrote it up, I put it in the text, and Coca-Cola demanded editing rights over my case study in order for me to use a photo of one of their vending machines. Consequently, since then, I have had no product placement that's required anyone's permission, but also I've traded that off with, I don't have the permissions, but they don't have the say. So everything you see in here is me picking up my examples. But this is also, yeah, we want to talk about a future. If you want to get into product placement brokering for advertise, for marketing lecturers, please let me know. Uh, the other thing about product placement is product placement is really amazingly powerful where it creates a solid resonance between the product and the brand. And if you've ever played Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and you hear Gorilla Radio, those two are inexorably linked. In fact, you can hear the skateboarding. Your memory will play the skateboarding over the top. The other place with the uh, product placement is obviously film and video, which means that YouTube is a big avenue for product placement. And we're seeing a lot of that come through now in terms of sponsored clothing, sponsored products, but also product placement has its potential where that's the key thing. So product placement to me would tie in very well with presumption, that you are intentionally consuming something for an audience through a product placement. And I think you've got a real value to be uh, pursued here. And I think it's an area that we haven't got as much practical match practice in. And the last thing I want to mention is, you know, sometimes it's just so subtle, you barely even notice it. Uh, this is from a, an old movie, an old Jason Statham movie, The Transporter. Uh, my belief is that the transporter will eventually get retconned into the greater Fast and Furious verse. So this particular moment stuck out because I was literally watching this clip uh, whilst I was preparing these slides. It's like, did he just get two Pepsis out of vending? He did. So it can be blatant. But the key is if you can work out where in your content you need to use a branded product 
and get those brands on board with backing you, supporting you, and provisioning you with the resources to be able to create more content that uses this branded product and uses this placed product, which you then endorse and you openly acknowledge. Because the whole idea is, say you want to do a lifestyle blog and you get IKEA on board. And you're sitting there on an IKEA provided couch. You want to endorse that couch and have a link to that couch so people know to buy the couch from IKEA so IKEA keeps sponsoring you. Subtle isn't what we need in this product placement sponsorship business. Direct is. All right, uh, just a quick reminder point of purchase, still a thing. Digital point of purchase, I'd like to thank Woolworths for reminding me of things I may have forgotten that I may have bought previously. Except I have never bought that, so little dark pattern sneakiness of sliding in something they're trying to promote and push forward amongst the, oh, hey, we remember that you bought this last time, but... Uh, no, no, I have not bought that product before, and you tried to pull a fast one. All right, word of mouth. Uh, this is organic sharing. Uh, I'm going to encourage this throughout the semester is where you have the opportunity to shout out and co-promote a fellow class member's project. Do it. Give it a go. Give it a shout out. Particularly in this, in the word of mouth, the whole idea is that organic conversations, people talking about your materials, the challenge becomes that back in the day, there was a certain level of kayfabe around marketing. Now, kayfabe is a wrestling term for pretending that the business, is, the fights are real, but the wrestling isn't fake. So the ca marketing kayfabe we didn't talk about the behind the scenes. We didn't talk about monetization and sponsorships and endorsements. The problem now is we've got a group of people who think of themselves as the smarts, the, the people who know that everything's fake and everything's fraudulent and everything's done by money, who experience no social costs to showing up on a post and shouting, that's sponsored, you got money for that, whether the person was paid or not. So word of mouth is becoming less valuable as an organic, hey, I've had a really great experience with this brand. Uh, so literally, I, the Pepsi Max shows up because when I'm producing these videos, I uh, consume this stuff. So it's just there. Also, I need a caffeine sponsor. I really do. Someone brokered this for me so I can move it out of word of mouth and into paid placement, please. But where we run into trouble, and we see this a lot on Twitter, is where people start talking genuinely about how I had this really great experience with this product, or I had a really great experience with this brand, or like, you know, you talk about a video game you've just played, saying, oh, this tights and fight, fights in tight spaces, this is awesome, and you, know, you should totally get on that. Some other people will come in and try to big note themselves by going, oh, you're just a paid shill seen it happening quite a bit on YouTube as well, that people find, go into the comment section just, they're hoping they're going to be the one that, you know, they spread this message a thousand times, one pays off, they get to say, see, I knew, told you so, I'm clever. They're wrong 900 times, 999 times, they're not right, they don't get to say, oh, see, I'm clever, but they work on the principle of spread it wide enough, make one hit, and they're a genius. So the other thing, um, this is where I just want to hook back to the legal stuff at the top of the show. Organic is not paid. If you are in receipt of paid reviews or you're using fake non-organic reviews, to start with, trash it. It's dumb. Um, yes, you can pay money to click farms and review farms, but that just says your product sucks and you suck as a person. And I, for one, do not want to hand over a bunch of money to somebody else to realize that my life is a joke and it's 
my work is meaningless. I don't want to actually pay someone for that. I want to find that out organically through my own staring at the ceiling in horror at 3 a.m. sometime. You're better off with paid. You're better off not having a review than having fake reviews because the, uh, well, the government and the agencies will thump you for it. But also, genuinely, uh, now, a product, product disclaimer, Cashy's Mechanics up in here, up in Brisbane, they have serviced my car a couple of times uh, for full, I pay full fee. I do know the owner, Lachlan, and I did, we have been at uh, unconferences together and we do, follow, like I follow him on Facebook, we do know each other on Facebook. So this is not a paid statement, but there is a relationship that I feel needs disclosing. So you know that I chose them in part because I could also trust that I knew some of the reviewers. Some of the people who have used Lachlan Service are people I know, so I knew that, that, okay, that's a real review. I have also written a review for them. So that is my disclaimer, even though it's not paid, you should know that there was a potential conflict of interest that I want to disclose so that you know, yep, yeah, this example is here because I have a connection to the organization who created the content. And the fact that I don't say this with the other elements is because I don't have those connections. All right, I want to talk about branding briefly. Um, I want to mention the whole function of a brand is in group, out group. The e-marketing subject is heavily branded. I am encouraging you to get really into branding, uh, self personal branding, uh, the Tom Peters uh, self as brand concept, hugely influential, very useful aspect. But the idea of branding is that branding creates an in-group, those who recognize the brand and associate and affiliate with it, and an out-group, either those who don't affiliate, but it can also create a contra-group, those who want to disaffiliate, do not want to be associated with the brand. Like you're not going to catch me can't running uh, the red and white Coca-Cola on these shows. It is... I love the way I always pull... You know I'm bad at this because I can't actually get the logo in shot first time. Now the other thing about branding, the ANU has a very good branding guide uh, under the ANU identity. You may or may not be able to reach that. It might be uh, firewalled, paywalled. But functionally, their identity guy talks about the font, the primary colors, the secondary colors, the logos, the imagery, the way in which the ANU is currently now presenting itself. Uh, this is the third brand change since I've been at the ANU. I like this one. I think the gold's a, a nice touch. I think it's trying very heavily to lean on our position as uh, Australia's number one by using the gold particularly coming online around the Olympics and that subtle nod to gold medal, first place, number one. The other thing about brands is brands are super useful for facilitating quick recognition. Every icon on a smartphone is a brand. Every logo that can be brought down to a 64 pixel by 64 pixel square and still retain legibility that you can recognize instantly, oh, that's what it is, that's what it does. That is getting it right. I should probably set up a challenge to say name all the, the brands on the screen. The final thing is brand decisions. Everything you do on the internet is branded. The username, the URLs you pick, if you buy a domain name or if you're using a custom URL, your social media icon conveys a brand message. Your photo you use, whether it be on Wattle or Facebook or wherever, it's all message. It's all branding. So this is why the selfless brand is super important in the modern era because everything is tied to name, identity, image. And then you start getting things like color schemes and recurrent color patterns and deciding what's actually your palette that you want to have for life choices. And I will say that black is a really good palette. There's a lot of, you know, 256 shades of grey. And black goes well with just about everything. 
the last thing I want to mention in the branding is within the site, we have a primary font, which is Road Rage. That's what all, that's the name of the font that we use for the logo. So the little uh, crest up here, that's in Road Rage. I use Trebuchet as my primary font. Uh, so the Word documents and the PowerPoint slides use Trebuchet for the main, uh, for its legibility. The light box, light shading, color shading on the boxes inside all the PowerPoints, hashtag F2, F2, F2. Also with 10% um, transparent. Yeah, 10% transparent in PowerPoint, so you can just see the image underneath it. The photos that are taken uh, that are uh, the start of the show and inform a lot of the, the video content, all of those images uh, run through a post-processing of four different color interventions to create that uh, cyberpunk purple uh, basically the bi-colour scheme, bi-lighting colour scheme of uh, strong purple and strong mauve, right, strong mauve, pinkish purples. Uh, there's also one of the things about the text. When you see the text outside of PowerPoint, you will see that there is a slight blurring on the outside of it. This is done to create... It's not actually in white font. Uh, it's not a white color image. It's two different image colors, a uh, vibrant blue and a vibrant pink. So there's that slight 3D blurring on the outside of it. That was an intentional choice to continue down the sort of cyberpunk-esque 1980s fluoro new, uh, new wave type of look. So last thing, theory and application. This week, I want to talk about a really useful uh, element for you. And this is thinking about how to work with stakeholder engagement. Now, in distribution, we mentioned about having a, an emergency plan, a crisis response plan. Here is stakeholder plan, how to engage with different stakeholders around communications, but also the role that each element of a social media approach and social media influences can play and what you would expect them to be able to do. So you've got here, uh, for example, the role. If you're a content creator, then your strength should be around certain outcomes. It should be around content. So my job is to create content. I'm not a multiplier. I'm not a distribution person. I don't run a review channel. Uh, so mine's not to create reach, mine is to create content. So they're different roles, different aspects. I like it for those of you who are running a social media platform. Uh, it might be really worth giving this look as a post facto when you get down to the, the e-performance review to be able to go this is the approach that I took and it resonates with this particular activity role or this type of input from that paper. So, as always, if you need me, I'm available on the platforms. Speaking of branding, every place where I can use my full name as my username, is that's what I use because I want to run that consistent brand on my presence across the internet. I'm a little inconsistent on my logos and photo use at the moment, but otherwise, it's all the, all the platforms. If that's if I'm there, that's the name I try for. As always, the email if you need it. We're coming into if you're watching this in real time. We're coming into the semester break. I will be available during the semester break if you want to reach out and contact, and if you want to let me know if you need anything during that period. Sing out, let me know. The bookings over Waddle consultations, and everything else. And with that, if you're doing this in real time, see you after the break. If you're doing this in blitz mode, take a break. You know, go get a snack, order a pizza or something. And then I'll see you after the break.